I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Kathy Cave Trumbull, who is um, the department head of uh, STEM education at the College of Education that is the building just next door to us. And thanks to uh, one of our staff members, Muntasar, we found Kathy. And uh, it was great because now I remember the first time we met, you said, oh, now I'm I, I found my playmates, okay, <laughs> uh, because uh, Kathy, um, you know, she was a professor of early childhood uh, science education at Ohio State University, and our guys at NC State University were so clever to bring her to us. So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Kathy and to thank you for being a partner on this uh, design institute. Thank you. Hello, good morning. And I am the only thing that stands between us and lunch, so I'll be efficient. <laughs> so, and I'm very delighted to be here with you today. And I, as Nelda mentioned, I was at Ohio State before I came here, and I was in early childhood science education, and one of the top early childhood programs in the U.S. And we had a lab school on campus, the Sophie Rogers Lab School, which is Reggio inspired. So I can make some connections between what Marcia talked about, and then also the work that I'm doing now uh, connects with what Carlos talked about earlier with movement. Um, and I can connect with this last question and that concern about making high quality, um, high quality early education accessible for all children. And if you notice on my slide, my current work, this is out of some work that I'm doing at NC State, and I was very delighted to, to meet Robin and Nilda, as she mentioned. My department focuses on middle childhood and high school. So I'm an administrator, and I'm several, and I've, that means I've gone to the dark side, so I, I apologize for that. But first and foremost, I am a classroom teacher. And I've been here at NC State for four years. And as you know, we are the land-grant institution for, NC, for the state of North Carolina. So go Wolfpack. And we are very committed to issues of poverty and making high-quality education for all children in the state of North Carolina. And I'm from Tennessee, so I'm your cousin next door. So I sound more like you than I did people in Columbus, Ohio, and especially more like you than I did uh, people from Cleveland and Akron. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be back where I get snow days and also where I, you have better accents, if I do say so. But the reason I say that is I worked um, with the Ohio Department of Education and also with the Title I programs and we developed training for preschool teachers and daycare workers throughout the state of Ohio. And that was a wonderful opportunity to work with educators across the state of Ohio, thousands of preschool teachers and daycare workers. So a lot of my work stems from, from that. So, and then I also had a, a federal grant where I worked with the University of Virginia, and we worked with um, Head Starts in Virginia Beach. So when I was contacted by Primrose, which like Reggio Emilio, as you mentioned, there are issues of access. When I was contacted by them, I, I met someone on a plane. We'd been to visit our children at college. And she said, oh, I'm in early childhood too. And she worked with Primrose. And they were interested in working on a science education project. So she took my name, we exchanged cards, and I thought, oh, that's like everybody on the plane, you never hear from them again. Well, they contacted me on Monday, they asked for my CV, they wanted me to go to Atlanta, and I put on the brakes. I thought, mm, I have very, like all of us, we have very limited time. I dedicate my time for, ch for children in need. So I looked at their website, and much like us, I mean, most of us in here are educated, middle class. I dedicate my time to work for children who are, who are special needs and also in, in situations of poverty in terms of access. So I thought, Primrose Schools doesn't need me. And then I thought, well, my daughter lives in Atlanta. 
It looks like an intriguing project. I could go, I could go check it out. I visited the school and also I heard their commitment. They partner with Save the Children and they work with, Save the Children works with, um, works with Head Starts. And also Primrose has a Primrose Promise. So with that, we're working toward right now developing some Primrose Promise schools so all children, and they are very committed to high quality um, early education for all children. So that um, explains, but I want to mention here that my uh, co-author, uh, Katie McCants, is here. So Katie, if you want to wave, Katie's in the back, back there. Katie worked with me on the, on, in terms of the research that I'm going to share with you. So intuitively, we know that what Carlos talked about is important. We know that what Maria talked about is important. If you've had a school garden or you take your children out in nature, you know how important that is intuitively. I'm going to share with you briefly some of the research that gives us that foundation on why this is not only an anecdotally good idea, but it's a research-based best practice. And then my other co-author is Dr. Maria Shaheen, who's with Primrose Schools in, in Atlanta, in Ackworth, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. Okay, the first question is, what is science? And Nilda did the Google search, and she shared that with us this morning. But when we think about science, it really is just looking at the natural world, but also it's about content and also skills. So you have the science content and the knowledge and the understanding, but also it's about the skills. It's also about understanding the nature of science, that science is different than magic. It looks magical sometimes, but it's, it's based on evidence. It's based on data. And children gather data all the time, and they can gather that through their drawing projects, like with Reggio, uh, with representing their data in multiple ways, in the multiple languages of children. And also, if you're familiar with Lillian Katz's work and what she does with project-based learning in young children. But it's evidence-based, and then also it's based on observations and inferences. And if you've ever, and you know working with little children, they come to us as natural explorers. They're very curious about the world. And I know this from working in preschools for many years now, almost 20 years. Nobody works her harder than early childhood teachers. From age three to grade three. Yes, give yourselves a hand. And, and I've worked in middle schools, high schools, universities, and grad schools. No one works harder than an early childhood teacher. And I'm not saying, and, but what I'm saying is they come to us and they're very curious and they are natural little explorers and they are natural little scientists. I'm not talking about imposing science on them. I'm talking about facilitating that wonder, stimulating that wonder, and perpetuating that wonder. But what we do, now this is, this is, a, this is symptomatic of the system. The system imposes standards and, and standardized testing and what we do most efficiently in the United States of America is very tragic. We institutionalize the wonder out of children. So what I'm talking about, and that's not an indictment against any teacher, that's an indictment against the system as we have developed it. But the, we are talking about facilitating and nurturing this wonder in children. So this is the kind of face we want to see, and we see that in a preschool classroom. And someone mentioned earlier, this is the type of instruction that should be going on and can be going on from preschool through graduate school. Tragically, it doesn't happen very much in elementary school, some in elementary school, much less in middle school, and that's where we lose them in terms of science and mathematics. And then much less in high school, college, and, and grad school, but it can happen. And we do have those faces. That's the face. Of a, of a research scientist in a laboratory at NC State or out in the field. And, I, and if you talk with one who is good about talking about his or her science, that's the kind of look you get from them. This is the kind of look you get when you talk to me about my research rather than administration. <laughs> okay, so why gardening? 
because this is what we're focusing on and looking at outdoor nature learning. So I'm talking to you do today about gardening. So why should we why should we consider? And at Primrose, we have a Primrose patch that's integrated. Every school has a school garden. So spare time, this is a quote, and I'm not going to read very much to you, but I'm going to read this one. Spare time in the garden, either digging, setting out, or weeding. There is no better way to preserve your health. And that's a quote from Last Child in the Woods. And then look at her face. And, and we know health-wise, it's good to dig in the dirt. Children who spend time in the woods and spend time outside digging in the dirt have fewer allergies and fewer health problems as adults. And why gardening and science? This is a natural fit for us. I had a, um, an urban planner, an engineer at Ohio State, contact me, and, we, and I left before we had a chance to actualize this project. But she had children in the preschool at, at Ohio State, and we wanted to plan a project with gardening. Uh, because it's a very natural fit. So it actively engages children with science concepts like basic, basic needs, heredity, life cycles, and weather, and also it helps them develop their inquiry skills, like observing, like recording data through digital images with, a, with an iPad or with a digital camera, or in terms of their drawing, like Reggio or um, project-based learning with Lily and Katz, or also they can record their observations with clay. Okay, our research questions. I'm going to share with you two parts. The first part is the research base for why include gardening in your schools. So this is, these are talking points for your administrators to convince them of the worth, but also talking points for um, your parents. And then also for your teachers the justification on why spend the time gardening. But these are the research questions that guided us, and Katie um, did a lot of this work. I had another doctoral student work with me. But my play, this is my playtime. So my playtime is having the doc student come work with me on these projects. So this is the only reason I can be an administrator is I get to play. So here's the, the potential, we're looking at the potential benefits of integrating gardening into science instruction, and we're also looking at the obstacles. What obstacles might this present? The way we went about this is we did um, research database searches with, um, with some databases with Eric and ProQuest, and in doing that, it's like, like doing Google search, like Nelda shared with you earlier. Except that this is specifically about research, and, it's, and ours are tailored specifically for research and education. So we did the searches. Katie and Katie, Katie Squared came up with 9,099 results. They looked at all of those. That's, that's what doc students get paid to do. So they, <laughs> they looked at all those, and they found 65 that were relevant. And they were, those were in 47 different peer-reviewed journals, including those that are listed here, like the International Journal of Early Childhood Environmental Education and the International Journal of Science Education. And then some of them were um, in nutrition journals, public health nutrition. It was very interesting that we had studies that looked at school gardening at all levels, and we had a, a more in preschool than we had in middle school and high school, but we also had the most in elementary school, which is not surprising. But I was very pleased to see that we had many in preschool. There was large geographic focus across those studies, um, and those are the, the countries that are listed, and you can see the visual image from the map, so they were scattered out across the globe. So with our results in terms of the benefits of gardening, so we were looking at, we, we put these results all in a matrix, we looked at a table, a spreadsheet, and then with doc students and I looked across to see what are the patterns. And the patterns fell out in broad categories. The first one was academic gains. So we looked at academic, and in an academic we saw science learning gains, and with science learning gains, we were talking about um, academic outcomes like test scores, 
course grades, and overall GPA. In fact, there was a, uh, an analysis of 48 studies within one that we're reporting. 93% of those studies po reported positive academic outcomes, and that was a study from 2013. So strong support for positive science academic outcomes, but also it helped them develop their process skills. And as I mentioned earlier, those process skills are observing, inferring, predicting, um, interpreting data, hypothesizing, and identifying variables. Okay, and this was a very interesting study out of Oman, and these were with seventh grade students, um, and they did it as an as a experimental and a control group. So when they looked at the experimental group used gardening, they had a gardening um, intervention, those who did the gardening had positive outcomes, they had positive increases in five of those six process skills. And it's very interesting, the group that didn't have the gardening intervention, they only had improvement on one process skill. And the, the one that the gardening group did not improve on was um, inferring, so making inferences based on their observations. And then that's what the control group did well on. So it was interesting how that worked out. But the gardening group improved on five process of the six skills, and the control group improved on only one. So gardening was good at helping them to develop their science skills to apply science and do science. Also, there were many studies that had uh, positive learning outcomes in other content areas like mathematics and literacy. Another um, example of benefits were for environmental stewardship. And this is something that Carlos talked about and also Marcia talked about. Um, with children being outside and having an appreciation, they develop empathy for each other and then also empathy for uh, living things out in nature. There was an interesting study with 71 second graders and this was a 2016 study and that study reported that children who participated in gardening, in school gardening, held more empathic views of nature after completing the gardening unit. So that's pretty strong support for gardening also. But it also changed their values and their attitudes toward nature. And they had more mindful behaviors and active involvement in taking care of nature and being good stewards. Also gardening, in addition, we've got academic, we have some of the soft skills with attitudes and dispositions, and then also we had, um, I mean, we had the, the empathy, the environmental stewardship, we had the academic outcomes, but also we have some additional soft skills, like the motivation and the community building. With the soft skills, and this was a group with kindergarten children, so if you notice, it's a wide range, and I'm just picking out one study for each slide so I don't bore you with all the details or lose you in the weeds. But this was an Australian study with kindergarten children, and they were involved in a school garden project. They, they reported positive in, more positive interactions among children, and also, this is important for preschool and kindergarten teachers, decreased antisocial and aggressive behaviors like pushing, shoving, and kicking. The teachers reported that children were calmer, less stressed, and more relaxed when they were outside and gardening. And that was a 2013 study. Okay, and then also one, um, the last one is on wellness. So that's something that we would think would be intuitive, but we have research evidence to support that gardening improves wellness behaviors and also wellness attitudes. Uh, there was a study of first graders, and when you're working with little kids, that involves getting permission from parents. So having 213 first graders in a study is, is pretty big. That's a, that's a lot of kids and a lot of little children, and this was a study in the U.S., but this study with um, first graders, 213 of them, compared children who were involved in a gardening intervention with nutrition education. So th and this was an experimental design, which is also hard to do. 
So there were three groups. One had gardening and nutrition education. The second one had nutrition education only. And the last one was a control group. They didn't have gardening or nutrition education. So the outcomes were that when they had gardening and nutrition compared to the control group, that group had higher knowledge of nutrition. They had more, they made more vegetable preferences. They expressed more vegetable preferences. And this was also important. When we do these research studies, usually we do the pretest get, um, data gathering right before the intervention and post intervention immediately after the intervention. Well, what we care is about lifestyle changes. So if we change it right after instruction, that's nice, but we want them to carry that with them and make that part of a lifestyle. So this study followed them six months later, and the children who had gardening and nutrition education together, had more, they had the retention of more vegetable preferences six months after they finished the intervention. The nutrition only group had some improvements, but they were not as high as the nutrition with gardening. So the gardening had a positive impact on, the, on wellness attitudes and wellness behaviors. And as Carlos was talking, this is critically important when children are spending less time outside. Oh, and also related to what Carlos, um, with Carlos's presentation, there, was, there were studies, and also if you notice on all my slides, these are examples because we had over 60 studies, so we picked out some examples to give you on the slide, but that is not an exhaustive list. But we also found that there was increased physical activity, which relates to Carlos's presentation, and also that children developed their motor skills. Okay, potential obstacles. These are pretty predictable with anything that is different from a, tr a traditional or typical curriculum, but these are the typical obstacles that the researchers found. One is time. We never have enough time. And when you're asking teachers, one thing we want to try to help them develop is project-based learning, so it can be a gardening project. And that's what Nilda and, and Robin do, our gardening and outdoor projects. So have the project and then integrate the learning around that rather than making it as an add-on or something in addition. It needs to be the heart and the core and the starting point. Also, um, another one is training and skills. And Robin and, and Nilda, I know, provide, and Montazar do, the support and the development. That's very important. <clears throat> in terms of teachers, number one, knowing how to effectively integrate gardening into their instruction, but also how to do gardening with young children. Then another one is about temporal limitations. Unless the children are in year-round school, you have the issue of when children are off from school and when do you start the gardening, and if you're working on a traditional academic calendar, gardening doesn't fit in exactly well there because the times of harvest don't match up with the school year. As a matter of fact, schools were designed and that our time schedule was scheduled around agrarian schedules. So we are the opposite of the harvest seasons. So that's a, another major issue. And then funding, um, being able to get the funds, but that's another opportunity for community gardens. Um, and then also changing teacher attitudes. But these obstacles are not insurmountable. We just need to be aware of them, and we need to be, make, be purposeful in the way we plan to address them. Okay, now I'm going to share with you a curriculum that I helped develop, in, as a, and I'm sharing with you what I've done with Primrose Schools, um, and that's the, they're helping support and sponsor this presentation. Um, this is the, a learning cycle that I developed. If you're familiar with a 5E learning cycle, when I was talking with Katie, Katie said, as we discussed this learning cycle, she said, that sounds like a 5E learning cycle, which is a very effective model for science instruction. That's for older children. This is an early learning uh, cycle, and this is recently out in young children. So another doctoral student that I had at Ohio State and I published out of that um, the work that I did with the Ohio Department of Education 
and I've applied that to Primrose. So this is a balanced learning cycle. So you have purposeful play, you have incidental play, you have purposeful play, and you have purposeful instruction. So it is different from Reggio in that way. So it is experiential, but it's a balanced approach where you have incidental learning and you have intentional learning. And I, I've done a study and I have a published study from a Reggio-based and inspired and Reggio-based preschool at the Sophie Rogers School at Ohio State. So I'm very familiar with that. Um, and Reggio is very science rich, but it is not science explicit. It is more science implicit. But looking at the, the balanced approach, it starts out with play. And I'm going to give you a specific example on how this plays out in the classroom, and you can ask questions. But starts out as play, and then goes to exploring, children are exploring, and then into discussion, and then throughout you're assessing on what is the child learning, what skills are they developing, and then we always go back to play. And I'm going to show you how this plays out. Also, you've heard about hands-on learning. Raise your hand if you've heard of hands-on learning. So almost everyone in here has heard of hands-on learning. Okay, hands-on learning is the explore part. That's where you're working with stuff. You're working with materials. The children are working with materials. The hearts on, that's, and actually this model came out of the work that we did at the Reggio um, preschool in, at Ohio State. The hearts on is the play. That's where you're connecting with them affectively. You're ex exploring, you're connecting with them. You start the cognitive connections, but also the psychomotor. And then you've got the discussion. The discussion part is the minds on. So you've got hearts on, hands on, and minds on. The discussion part is the part that we often leave out. It looks like science. It might smell like science. With gardening, it might taste like science. But if they, we don't have the discussion and purposeful and being explicit on what are they supposed to take away from this, then we don't have learning. And that happens a lot in elementary classrooms, it happens in preschools, it happens in universities, and it happens in high schools and middle schools. I've worked in those contexts. We have to label the learning. So there does have to be an introduction of new vocabulary sometimes. Okay, so here's our example. And the targeted concepts that would fit in with gardening, I picked out, um, I picked out two major ones. One, the first one is taking care of plants and their needs. That is a science concept, the basic needs of living organisms. So that's basic needs of plants and basic needs of animals. So you can do that with pets in the classroom. You can do that by connecting with pets at home. You also can do that with feeding birds outside and watching what birds do. But then you've got gardening or taking care of plants at school is a way to, to connect with basic needs of plants. Okay, and then the one we're going to focus on now is the life cycle of plants because that is gardening. That is an application of life cycle of plants. So that we start out with playing with plants. And I will tell you, I, I visited preschools in Finland. I was in Finland at the end of August, 1st of September last year. And visiting the preschools, they are equipped to go outside. It's the end of August, and every child has a snowsuit. They have their rubber boots. They have their mittens and their hats, and they're all labeled, and they have a mud room that they come into, and they have drying racks. So the schools are equipped. Those children, it is by law they go outside every day independent of the weather. So it would have to be really extreme, and that's true in most of the Scandinavian countries is that is part of, that is part of the expectation. The Finns are very proud of their, we, we have, and it's, very tragic to say this today. We are proud of our, our right to bear arms. That's what we talk a lot about in this country. And I'm not, I'm not getting into that issue, but I'm doing the contrast. The Finns talked to me over and over again. It didn't matter where I was. They talked about a right to roam. 
And I was not there for gardening. I was there for a European science education research conference. They talked about the right to roam. And what that means is you can walk anywhere in the country of Finland. People can walk across your backyard. They can collect mushrooms and berries as long as they can't pick from your garden. But they can, if you've got berries, they can forage and they can cross your property. They can't camp on your property in your backyard, but they have a right to roam and they can go. There is no, There are no places they can't go. They can walk anywhere. And when I went to the national park there to hike, because that's something I do, when I went hiking, there were parents out there and they were gathering berries with their children with buckets. They forage for mushrooms. When I visited elementary classrooms, now I visited the preschools, I told you about that. When I visited the elementary schools, they were teaching about plants and they were helping children identify native plants and which ones were edible and which ones weren't. That's a pretty important lesson for children. So that's, that's how they were focusing, making it very natural. And this is from New Zealand, this right-hand picture, because I had to include it. They have, and it was an urban setting, it was an urban context. By law, to be accredited in New Zealand, you, all children must have all day access to indoor and outdoor space, and they can choose where they want to be. So every preschool I visited, every room faced outside and had a wall of windows and a sliding glass door, and they went out to a little patio, and that was covered. Everyone had a, co they had covered space. They had indoor space, covered space. This was on the covered space, and they had an herb center too, where the children were experiencing fresh herbs. Um, and I'm talking about the toddlers and the, and the infants have this opportunity also, and it's shared space, multi-age space. But this was the gardening center. So they had this up under the covered space, and they have the silk flowers, and they had gardening implements, and they were digging. It's like a, like a sensory table, like the water table filled with sand um, that, that they could pretend to plant their plants in. But they also had, then the next step down, they had another area with, like they might have a big rug with Legos, big Legos to play on. And then they had another space where they had their school garden and those children planted, they tended, they harvested, and they took it directly into the kitchen and they cooked it for their lunch. So that was very, very much farm to table right there in their urban setting. But we start with play so they can experience. This one is very, teach, very teacher away. It's not teacher centered, it's very child centered. But it is purposeful play because we're going to start looking at gardening and life cycle of plants so we put things out that facilitate that. So children can choose what they're interested in, but we have purposeful play, and they're using their own language and they're experiencing. Okay, the next one is we start exploring. So the first one I mentioned is hearts on. This is the hearts on with playing. And the next one is the hands on part that we're familiar with. You can put a, a seed, a big bean seed, in a plastic baggie and tape it on the window with a moist paper towel, and they can watch that seed germinate and watch the roots shoot down. They can watch the stem go up and defy gravity, and they can watch the roots go down and use gravity to help them move down. So, and they're moving, to, and they can watch that through the clear bagging but also planting seeds in containers and watching them germinate in the container and tending them inside with their seedlings. So they've got their seed and they're exploring with seeds. Sometimes we have them sort seeds, how, and the, the, you can do sorting activities with seeds. You can do, um, in terms of a math skill, you can do sequencing and you can go from smallest to largest seed. And then they transfer their seeds out into the garden. They tend the garden, and then they harvest, and that connected. I was so delighted to see the example that Marcia gave was with carrot harvesting. So we had carrot harvesting. So we've got the exploring with the hands-on part, so you get the idea with that. And also, they're experiencing it. And one thing with the, the learning cycle, children use their own language 
you encourage them to use their own language. So they, they talk about what it, and use their own words however they want to. Then in the next stage is when we introduce new vocabulary. AAAS, the American Advancement for, well, I forget what AAAS stands for. No. AAAS is what? American Association for the Advancement of Science. I always get the A's confused. Thank you. Criticizes science education in the United States as being taught ineffectively as a foreign language. So in the first year of biology, the first time anyone experiences biology, they are thrown, more vocabulary words are thrown at them than in a first year of a foreign language. And at least we learn our foreign languages. So we don't introduce the vocabulary up front. The children use their own language during play. They use their own language during the hands-on part. So we're not introducing, we're not imposing. We have, these are, these are designed and intentional. This is the intentional part. So we've gone from the incidental with play to the intentional with the hands-on. So it's intentional, and we're encouraging them to use their own language. We use their own language. We ask them questions. So it's still very child-centered, and the most important job that we have is preparing the materials, facilitating that, and asking them questions, helping them make observations, guiding their observations, having them do drawings of the plant, draw the sea, Draw what happens when, the, when something pops out. What's happening? The seed is splitting. Something's sticking out. It looks like a leaf. And then something else is sticking out. It looks like strewn. So we help them use their own words and record it through drawings or digital images. And then they make observations about how the plants change. One thing we do in the primrose patch is the children, as a class, have a picture once a month with the patch, with the children. That's the perfect way to teach seasons. You look at those sequenced over time, look at how our plants change, look at how our clothing changed. So that's how we teach seasons. Okay, and then the next part is the part that we often forget, or we often don't do, or we don't know to do. This part is the mind zone part. This is the discussion part. This is where we teach a, and a three-year-old and a four-year-old and a five-year-old can learn the word germinate because they, I know they learn the word ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic means it sticks to a magnet. And if, if you don't believe me, how many of you have ever known a three-year-old who knows scientific names for dinosaurs? Yes. So they can learn the word germinate but we don't introduce the word germinate until they've observed it. Then we come back here and we look at the life cycle. An important way to do that is labeling and scaffolding the language. When we talked about strings and we talked about strings coming out and the leaf breaking the seed open, that's when the seed germinates. And then it makes sense to them. And they love to share those with their parents. So when you introduce it appropriate, appropriately and you scaffold the language, then it, then it works. So an important point for the discussion is using nonfiction text. This is out of work that I've done with Nell Duke at Michigan, the University of Michigan. And Nell Duke does research, and she doesn't like to work with children. She says this herself. She only likes to work with children when they're not able to wipe their own noses. <laughs> she if they, once they learn to wipe their own noses, they're too old for her. So she works with little children, but she's done research with all children. Children who have opportunities to engage with nonfiction text do better on standardized tests, which is not our goal, but that's a nice outcome. Also, boys are more interested in literacy when you provide nonfiction text. And this, this is out of a project with National Geographic that I've done with Nell Duke. So these are pictures that we can use with the National Geographic for the images of the life cycle and then plants on the, on the farm and also looking at the seed as the starting point for the life cycle of the plant. 
And then also when they're harvesting, and if you notice, these are different levels of books with different amounts of text on the pages and um, different purposes. But then they're harvesting, and then when they harvest, they can identify here are the leaves of the plant, here are the seeds of the plant that we eat, here are the roots of the plant we eat, and the stems that we eat. And then we always return back to play. So our conclusions, gardening has benefits like academic gains, environmental stewardship, soft skill development, and wellness, but also it requires that we help and support teachers to be able to effectively implement it in the classrooms. Hi, do you do we have time for questions? Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was very curious to hear about the research that's being done where nutrition education sticks a little more when there's a yeah. gardening aspect. Yeah. Um, I'm a group of a lot, about 25 dietitians that provide nutrition education during public schools and in daycares. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this growing mon momentum for gardening. Everybody wants it. And we're installing gardening at, gardens at preschools and daycares, but the question that we're faced with now is, how do you create sustainable gardens? After you put them in, we have the resources to put them in, we have the desire to have them, we have the nutrition education to back them, but how does it stick and how does it stay around and do you have pointers for that? Because that's where we're at right now. We can do it, but we want something that's going to last and be sustainable. That's a, that's a great question and I think that would be one that Nilda and, and Robin can speak to more than I can. But I've worked for the Kentucky Department of Education and also working in schools myself, I can only talk in anecdotally. They have research on sustainability with that. But one is helping, helping the administrators and the parents and the teachers understand the value of the gardening and the payoff for the gardening. So part of it is PR and convincing them. And, and part of that can be through research. And then part of it will be what they see in terms of the engagement with the children. I think for classroom teachers, especially for older children, is to see that it can be project-based learning where it's not just, it's not, quote, just gardening, that it's that's a wonderful learning opportunity, and it's not just about, it's not just about health and nutrition, it's a, a component of that is their diet, but also it's not just about dietary needs and dietary choices, it's also about movement and the psychomotor and health that way, and also with the cognitive gains. Yes, good question. Um, I'm a certified horticulture therapist, and a lot of what you're talking about is horticulture therapy. And with using horticulture therapy in, the, in your schools and so on, what we do is focus on using goals and objectives for each of our students. And that's one of the re ways that we keep the program going and have it more of a buy-in Mm -hmm. for the different schools and populations and so on. So you might want to go online and look up horticulture therapy because there's a, an amazing number of people all over the United States that actually do that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's a good recommendation. Thank you. When you began talking about accessibility, you mentioned mm -hmm. a couple of times Primrose Promise. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what the Primrose Promise is and how that helps for... Um, educators to access okay. some of these curriculums? And it's something that they're working on developing right now, and I, I'm, I don't have depth of knowledge on that, but it's one thing that I know that they're working on right now is, one, they have a um, partnership with Save the Children, and they have, they have partner schools through Save the Children, and they have, um, and those are our Head Start classrooms. And then also I know that they are looking at the possibility of developing Primrose Promise schools. So those are the things that th they've been thinking about and talking about. So that's in the planning stages. I know that. Uh, just offering a resource to educators um, 
that um, many seed companies will give you free seeds. Okay. Um, you don't have to be buying seeds that can add up. Uh, botanical interests will, for ship, just shipping costs, will send you 100 seeds. Um, so there are, there's support in that way. And then another way is planting things that are perennial. Um, I know that when you're in the, the standard school system, yeah, your summers are off and you're right. And so perennials offer you that opportunity to not have to maintain it during the summer other than maybe watering and also getting community involvement in mm -hmm. that and like having a community mm -hmm. garden, having t parents have the chance to be like, this is your plot, yeah. come and maintain it and so yeah. that your kids can have it throughout the rest of the year and in the summer you get to eat the food out of it. Thank you. I want to make and one closing comment back to the horticulture therapy. In terms of thinking about, this is really important in terms of teachers that you work with, parents you work with, and administrators, don't sell children short. I've had people say oftentimes, you know, a, little, a, a small child can't do that. Um, this, a, a child that I worked with in Columbus, Ohio, in a, in a Head Start program, he was five years old and he had, he had an IEP. And he had, um, he had been diagnosed already at five with ADHD. Well, if you give them the right materials, his, one of his tasks, one of his goals was to stay on any task for five minutes. Well, he would work with a microscope and mealworms, mealworms as insect larvae, for 45 minutes. You give them the right materials and something that's engaging that he could physically do and something that's intellectually engaging, they can do it. Also, they can draw. Look at the Reggio results. Look at the project-based learning results. I had someone who reviewed an article for me for Science and Children say preschool children shouldn't be drawing their observations to record them. So well, how else are they going to? And that's not developmentally appropriate. That usually means, usually when someone says that, you know, I'm afraid I couldn't do that myself. I don't think a child could do it. But the children are not afraid of doing it. <laughs> so don't sell children short. But thank you very much. Thank you.